So I have staked my entire career, million dollars of federal funding, and my entire reputation on the idea that a delta function is actually a function. Let's find out how screwed I am. So you know the delta function. The delta function is one of these things that comes up in differential equations, like in a book like this. And in particular, one really cool place that it shows up is in the solution to two-point boundary value problems. Or more generally, we can talk about a partial differential equation. And in this case, I'm looking at a beam that is fixed at two points here and here. You can see its response to impulse, and the result is a sound wave. And now if I make a function across this beam here, I can see the overall result if we struck each of these points all at the same time with those varying amplitudes. And that's what the Green's function allows you to do. It takes the response to an impulse, and it tells you what'll happen given a general input. Or if you don't want to talk about a beam being hammered at two ends, you can also think about a string in a guitar or a violin. A Green's function will tell you how your system's gonna end up behaving in response to you strumming the string. And here, the hammer strike and the strumming of a string are all impulses, and these impulses are delta functions. If you take a look at the earliest place that a delta function appears, and I think it's in chapter seven, it is obvious that the delta function is not a function in the usual sense, and instead is an example of what is called a distribution. And so, Nagel Saf and Snyder, we have that the delta function is not a function. And these are some pretty smart guys. So who the hell am I to say that the delta function is actually a function? So a distribution is a functional, a mapping from a vector space to a space of scalars that that vector space is posed over. And so if you have a space of functions, then evaluation at a point, or say evaluation at zero, is a functional that maps a function to the value it takes at the origin. This is the functional that is the delta function. So in this sense, a delta function is a function that maps functions to real points. But that's not the kind of function I'm talking about when I say that the delta function is a function. But we're gonna have to start with these distributions and whittle it down until we can actually get to exactly what I mean. The first vector space I want to talk to you about is the space of C infinity functions with compact support. This means that these are functions that can be differentiated as many times as you like and you still get a continuous function. They are also only non-zero in a small bounded region. When you talk about the delta function working on this vector space, this is what you get as a distribution. But then you can make that space a little bit bigger and you can talk about functions that don't disappear after a certain point but decay very, very quickly. And this is called a Schwartz space and this is also known as a space of rapidly decreasing functions. These are functions that go to zero as you go off to infinity, even if you take their derivative or if you multiply them by a polynomial. And when we talk about the delta function there, it is called a tempered distribution. And the difference between a distribution and a tempered distribution is that there are a lot less tempered distributions because there are a lot more Schwartz space functions. So it's easier to be continuous over a smaller set than it is to be continuous over a larger set. And so we see we get more and more structure over our functionals as we make our sets bigger. Now, the collection of tempered distributions is a fun collection to talk about. And I've talked about it at length on this channel in full lectures I have over on my tomography playlist. But here, let's just take a look at a simple example. The functionals that you get when you take a function f out of your vector space and multiply it by something else, uh, usually another function, let's say it's a Gaussian. And if you take a Gaussian, you multiply by that function, and you integrate from, say, negative infinity to infinity, that combination of multiplication and integration is a functional. And what happens is if we take that Gaussian and we keep the area the same, so let's normalize it and make it area one. If you take that Gaussian and you make it narrower and narrower so that you're putting most of the area all around the origin, what ends up happening is that as it gets to be sort of infinitesimally narrow, the limit of these functionals is actually going to be evaluation of that function at zero, which is our delta function. So we can approximate a delta function with a collection of tempered distributions, but we're still not quite at what I mean by the delta function being a function. But there's another step between here and there. So now let's consider a space of continuous functions that vanish at infinity. This is a larger set than the Schwartz space, which itself contains the C infinity function's compact support. And the Reese representation theorem says that if you're a bounded linear functional on this space, then that functional may be represented through a measure. And in this case, the delta function is a continuous linear functional and is represented by what we call the delta measure. This means our delta function can be represented as a measure. And since the space contains all the previous spaces we were talking about, that means that the functional can be represented as a measure for all of those as well. But a measure isn't a function. So what gives? If we want to see a delta function represented as a function, we need to shift our space again. 
and we're going to talk about a space of functions that are complex analytic over the entire complex plane. So we're switching from functions of a real variable to functions of a complex variable. And we're also going to ask that these functions satisfy a certain norm. That will ensure that all of the integrals we want to talk about actually exist. This space of functions is called the Fox space. Okay. So why don't we take a look at this integral here? This is the integral of our function over the entire complex plane against a complex Gaussian. Now we can reduce this integral very quickly by changing the polar coordinates. And since the function f is the only one that's affected by theta, we can move that integral to the inside and take the complex Gaussian out. Using the power series expansion of f, we can see that the only term that actually survives is the constant term, and that comes out with the 2 pi. And then the remaining term is something that can be handled by somebody who has taken calculus too. And this is quickly seen to be one half. And we see here that the integral against this complex Gaussian actually ends up being simply f evaluated at zero. But the integral against the delta measure is also f evaluated at zero. So that means that here we have our delta measure represented as a function. And so here we go. This is the first time we've seen the delta function as being a function. But this can be generalized to many more spaces. And that requires the Ries theorem for Hilbert spaces. Okay, so reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. These are Hilbert spaces that consist of functions where the evaluation functional at every point is a bounded functional. And if this is a bounded functional, then that means by the Ries representation theorem that there has to be a member of that Hilbert space that represents that functional through the inner product. And so that means our delta function is a function. And in fact, our delta function is a reproducing kernel. And so you might say, is this really useful anywhere? Well, the idea that the delta function is a function in a reproducing kernel Hilbert space is absolutely fundamental to all of signal processing. In fact, if you look at the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, I'll tell you something that nobody else really tells you about here on YouTube, and that there's yet another person that contributed to this, and that was G.H. Hardy. It's hard to imagine that people would ignore G.H. Hardy and his contribution to signal processing. What he did in particular is he took the sync function that Shannon introduced in order to get an approximation of a function, and he showed that that's actually a reproducing kernel. And you can read more about this here. This is Sampling Theory in Fourier and Signal Analysis by Higgins. And there he talks about all sorts of different perspectives, and he also talks about what is called the Paley-Wiener space. This is a space where you see the sync function as being a reproducing kernel. But that's not the only place that uses reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. In all these sort of regularized regression problems, it turns out that you can find a unique minimizer in the span of kernel functions for a host of different machine learning applications, including classifiers and support vector machines. And of course, if you've been following my channel, you've been seeing how I've been applying this to dynamical systems. That's a story for any of the many videos I've made so far. So it looks like I'm not alone in thinking of the delta function as an actual function, and I'm followed by big people like G.H. Hardy. And so maybe I'm not that screwed after all. And if you would like to watch something fun, I made this video on fixed point iteration, which I really enjoy here.